Hey everyone, it's Sarah. Welcome back to Scatterbrained, where we talk about the most interesting subjects you may have never thought about. So last week I spoke about Theta Berra, who was the quintessential early 20th century vamp. I thought it was pretty interesting, I hope you guys did too. But today we're going to go in a different direction, something that's more of a modern day yikes. That's right, we're talking about the all-American blunder, the Sultan Sea. For reference, the Salton Sea is about 180 miles southeast from Los Angeles. It's a bit past ritzy, celeb-ridden Palm Springs, meaning that this is a spot with a lot of potential for 20th century developers. People were flocking to Los Angeles in droves, and demand for vacation spots were sky high. But today, it's home to many ghost towns in poverty amidst the 21st century wealth of Palm Springs in Southern California. At 110 square miles, the Salton Sea is now shrinking due to California's frequent droughts and the lack of agricultural runoff, which was the sea's main water source. I am going to quote an Atlantic article which sums up the scientific and environmental harms posed by the sea. It explains that a lot better than I ever could. The problem is exacerbated by both California's ongoing drought and the shallowness of the lake. Because the Salton Sea is so flat and shallow, a vertical foot of drop can expose thousands of feet of horizontal playa, or dry lake bed, explains Bruce Wilcox, an ecologist and the Assistant Secretary for Salton Sea Policy, a recently created position within California's Natural Resources Agency. As the playa is exposed, it dries quickly in the desert heat and sun, desert wind kicks up the dust, creating a serious air pollution problem. Imperial County, which houses the lake, currently has the highest asthma hospitalization rates in the state. Because the lake has been used as an agricultural sump for more than a century, the dust also contains pesticides and officials are concerned about the presence of potentially toxic heavy metals like arsenic. Alright, so you might be thinking, how did it get that way? But it's kind of a long story. The Salton Basin has been around for thousands of years, but the Salton Sea story actually begins in 1905. It was a happy accident, a product of poor irrigation techniques at the beginning of the 20th century, which led to runoff. By 1907, it became a sizable 400 square mile body of water, the Salton Sea. Because of this design, the Salton Sea does not have a direct water source, rather it evaporates or becomes groundwater. And because of this outcome, the Salton Sea has extremely high salt levels. Alright, enough of the early 20th century. Let's fast forward to post-war America during the 1950s and 1960s. Suburbia was popping up, Americans had a lot of money to spend, and American families wanted to spend their money on taking their offspring to a different location. Because change of scenery. I must say that the mountains towering the landscape provide a stark contrast to the Colorado desert, and the beautiful scenery is a lot more beautiful than suburbia. And of course, what was not to love about the area, Palm Springs was already known to be a celebrity hotspot, and soon they started flocking to the Salton Sea. Celebrities like Frank Sinatra and millionaires from around the world came to experience the beautiful sea in the desert. Naturally, businesses took advantage of the local tourism boom. Small businesses thrived here, and the area soon became known for its quintessential 1950s kitsch. But of course, our fun can't last for too long. Because by the 1970s, the issues posed by the Salton Sea became too apparent to ignore. Yes, there were problems with the salinity levels during its heyday in the 1950s and 60s, but by the 1970s, the high salinity content became impossible to ignore. Dead fish and their skeletons began to dot the shores of the place that was once one of the most lucrative fishing spots in America. Fertilizer and pesticide runoffs became a problem. Garbage appeared on the shores. It just began to look gross. And optics speak volumes. So, of course, tourism dried up a lot quicker than it came. Business left and the people of the Salton Sea area began to move with them. Unfortunately, except the people who couldn't afford to leave. This only created cycles of poverty, and the risks initially posed by the Salton Sea only became more apparent. The state has tried various rehabilitation projects, but unfortunately, due to bureaucratic inaction and other reasons, they just kind of faded out. As news of the Salton Sea's abandoned nature started to become more popular, it's actually become kind of an alternative tourist hotspot. It's not like you'll find hordes of people, but you might see various people taking pictures of abandoned sites or art around the area. Even Anthony Bourdain visited Bombay Beach. Personally, I've always had an obsession with the old and abandoned. 
And I've realized that there are a lot of people like me who have similar interests. I think this explains why tourism in the Salton Sea has become well, more prevalent lately, you know? Fortunately, over the past few years, the area has seen some positive change. And yes, a lot of these efforts are fantastic, but it's also important to realize that these efforts are very localized and primarily on a private level. Still, the area is lacking in a larger, long-term effort to rectify the issues of this very dire situation. However, it's important to realize the preservation efforts in this area. A spot that really interests me is called the Dos Palmas Reserve, which is a preservation area designated in the early 1990s, which really highlights the diverse wildlife native to the area. This wildlife and fauna was around way before the Salton Sea was developed. They're still there today, and they're going to be there a lot longer than we ever will be. There's also a banana museum with over 20,000 banana related objects. One of the most interesting parts to me is the Bombay Beach Ruins area. Bombay Beach really epitomized that 1950s vacation post-war boomer culture. And today it's home to a small alternative art scene. Take for example the Bombay Beach Biannual, which according to its website is The Biannual, founded in 2015, transforms abandoned housing, vacant lots, and decaying shoreline into a unique canvas for creative expression. Artists, philosophers, creators, and makers across many mediums donate their time and talents to the volunteer-led happening. At its inception, it was an annual weekend event. However, the group is now focusing their time and energy on events throughout the year, even though everything is just canceled now, but you get the point. Anyway, the Biennial was founded in 2015, and they've explored a bunch of different art projects. They've transformed abandoned building, vacant lots. They've added different types of permanent art structures around the city. It's very much community organized and community based with an emphasis on helping the local community instead of trying to propagate a specific message. And while this may seem a bit too hipsterish for my personal taste, I think it's great what they're doing. If you take a look at their website, it's pretty evident that these people want to create long-term change and that they are really focusing on communities. It lacks the capitalist feel and corporate backing for it to actually be gentrification that we're so familiar with. So I really think that's great. It's showing how art can help on a local level without intruding the lives of the people who actually freaking live there. Another way this is evident is when I was doing research for this, I saw reports interviewing local people, people who have been there their whole lives. And while there were a few disgruntled people, for the most part, the local community, the people who have lived there their whole lives, are enthusiastic that people are bringing new light and art into their area. They feel that it's an honor and they very much respect it. They're excited that outsiders are adding life to their community. I do think that we need to be careful. The truth is, is that many of these artists live part-time in the community, and that's fine. However, for the long-term change that this area so deserves, I think that there needs to be more year-long residents invested in this movement. The ones who can't go back home. The few people still living there right now need to be able to live affordably. Listen, I'm not a city planner or a professional in this in any sort, but I think we can all say is that sustainable growth is the result that we want to see, not displacement. The area still has a while to go to solve the long-term economic and public health issues that continue to plague the Salton Sea area, Southern California, and the U.S. in general. The Salton Sea's current condition is the product of our institutional failings. If you think about it, the Salton Sea's heyday was actually very brief confined to a period of the 1950s and 60s until people started realizing that this area was a hazard. By the late 1960s and early 70s, scientists were already warning the public about the high pollution levels and the fish that were starting to show up dead on the shore. I think the area grabs our attention because it's symbolic of a time gone by, a time that briefly existed and maybe never did exist, an America that never will be. The issue is a lot broader. It's not just about Southern California, California, or even the United States. I think it's another example of the fact that we can only control nature and our environment for a limited time. Will we ever learn this message? Who knows?